Welcome to Dare to be Seen, brought to you by Alyssa Vilpez Productions and EDN Publishing. Join our hosts, Alyssa DiNapoli, aka Alyssa Vilpez, author, artist coach, hypnotherapist, singer-songwriter, and drummer, as she engages in down-to-earth, insightful, and inspiring conversations with female indie singer-songwriters around a virtual campfire. We shall discuss the lessons, songs, and personal stories of women who dare to be seen, scratching beneath the surface to give you an insider look into what makes their chosen career sometimes challenging and yet always inescapably compelling. So let's get the show started. Welcome to another episode of Dare to be Seen. I'm your host, Elisa Di Napoli, a.k.a. Elisa Vulpas, and today's episode features Aurora Engine. Aurora is an harpist, singer-songwriter, electronic musician, living and working in Leith, Edinburgh, Scotland. She's also a pianist, a composer, a music technology enthusiast. Her live performances bring harps, loops, effect pedals, vocals and synths all woven together to create ethereal sounds. And her lyrics can be heartfelt or comic. Her music can be multi-layered or simply a voice and a harp. Before we meet our guest for today, I would like to invite you to go to tinyurl.com slash podfreebies and you will be able to download for free my essential vocal warm-up so you can perform with authentic confidence while keeping your voice safe and healthy. And now, here's our guest for today. I think I have just shot my horse. He's bleeding all over the floor. And I personally used my music to perhaps communicate in ways that I just didn't feel that I could communicate in other ways. So, for example, um, I wasn't that good at expressing my feelings or talking about things, but I could put things into a song. Perform music and to put it out there, you have to have a little bit of the extrovert in you. But to get to that writing place, to, to get to the place where you can really produce some interesting and satisfying work, you have to also be able to lock yourself in a cave. I just did not want it anymore. anymore, anymore. When you perform, you have to convince people that what you're saying and what you're doing is worth listening to. I think, I think confidence is such an interesting thing in music, and I think that it's something that should actually be taught at music college. things that I would say there to, to my younger self is to just let go of perfectionism because I think perfectionism is a huge it's something that really holds, holds musicians back and I say this a lot it's about waiting until everything's perfect before you before you put it out before you release a record before you um, before you do a performance So let's welcome to the show today Aurora Engine calling from Leith in Edinburgh. But um, Aurora, I know that you've got a bit of an accent. So where are you actually originally <laughs> from? A bit of an accent, yeah. Okay, so um, originally I am from County Durham, um, which is just kind of uh, about 30 miles south of Newcastle. 
and um, and I went to university in Newcastle and lived in Newcastle for probably about um, eight or nine years after that. So yeah, a lot of people think I'm Geordie, um, apart from anybody who's from Newcastle who's insistent that I'm not Geordie. But, yeah. <laughs> and and for those that are listening from America, that's in the UK. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it's a pleasure having you here today, even though you're just on the other side of town. And But, you know, I'm not allowed to, to see you anyway, so we couldn't do this in person. <laughs> I know that you've got many, many interests, and um, I'm quite curious about all of them. You're a composer, you're a singer-songwriter, but you also do uh, electronic music and you're into music technology. So we'll definitely cover that today. So before we get into that, though, just a simple question that I ask everyone that comes on the show is, um, how did your love for making music actually surface in your life in the first place? Um, well, I was a, a piano player from quite an early age. I, um, I, you know, my dad taught me from when I was six or seven. And, um, and then I went on to do lessons. But really, songwriting started for me very, very early. I started writing my own songs at 12. I think I wrote my, fir my first song. It was a big outlet for me. Um, and I, yeah, I would, I would just sit at the piano and write, and then that just grew and grew and grew and developed. Um, and then I went off to uni and just continued writing there, and then branched out into composition. And um, and yeah, it's just followed me throughout my life really. And I think it's been an enormous form of uh, expression and communication as well. I would say, yeah. So it's um, communication in terms of what's going on inside of you, kind of an emotional. Um output for you would you say yeah I, th I definitely think so I mean if you listen to my music hopefully you would you'd see that that my lyrics are certainly quite um to the bone at times and I, and I sometimes think that um being a musician well I, I, I have a theory this isn't based on anything apart from knowing a lot of singer-songwriters <laughs> and people who make who make music especially music with words and I do think that um the so singer-songwriters use the music to communicate quite a lot and I personally used my music to perhaps communicate in ways that I just didn't feel that I could communicate in other ways so for example um I wasn't that good at expressing my feelings or talking about things but I could put things into a song and I think that was how I ended up um taking this route because it was it was an outlet and a form of communicating with um with with, I guess, people closer to me and, and wider audiences, really. So, yeah. I can relate to that because when I was growing up, I actually was quite uh, the same and I was a bit of an introvert. Maybe I still am. I mean, would you say you yourself, do you identify with being an introvert or is that not really uh, relevant? Yeah, I think in lots of ways. I think, I think, um, I think as with a lot of musicians, we, we kind of have a, a state of being both an introvert and an extrovert because I think in order to... to to perform music and to put it out there, you have to have a little bit of the extrovert in you. But to get to that writing place, to, to get to the place where you can really produce some interesting and satisfying work, you have to also be able to lock yourself in a cave for, for quite a prolonged time, especially when you're producing your own material, I think, um, and, you, and you're actually creating the whole thing. Um, that there has to be time where you just do lock yourself away. So I think it's just a little bit of a seesaw of um of both really yeah. yeah i completely relate to that it's like a split personality disorder yeah <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah and I've, I've had trouble sometimes accessing the extrovert part of me because i would say i'm um I, I lean more towards the introvert but you know getting out and performing you have to you have to sell yourself you have to you have to do that whether it's selling yourself you know um physically I don't mean selling yourself. I mean selling yourself using physical products like um, you know CDs and stuff like that. Or whether it's just the way you perform. When you perform, you have to convince people that what you're saying and what you're doing is worth listening to. You know, so that's um, yeah, that's something that I think you have to have a little bit of both in a bit of the introvert and a bit of the extrovert in as well. So I can definitely relate to that. For me, it was a big problem at one point actually in my life at the performance side of things I felt quite shy and um, I felt almost like I had to access this other or alter ego if you like um, so do you have a way that helps you to uh, to shift from one to the other uh, yeah I definitely think adopting the stage name helped with that um, because I think that it, it allows you to create kind of a persona that when you go on stage, I am Aurora Engine, 
and that gives you just a little bit of a of a different character to be able to step into to to be able to perform. I think really though, what I would say about performance is that a lot of it was just repetition. It was getting out there a lot. You know, I did a lot of performing, a lot of performing before I felt that it was I was natural enough to really be communicating with the audience. You know, I'll be honest that you know, I mean, I probably had a good few years of being quite awkward which isn't always a bad thing um but but I would say that I was a slightly reluctant performer and I think um it did take me quite a lot of time to overcome that but I would say it was repetition uh, of just getting out there and doing it as much as I could right yeah. right and so do you do you think that's held you back in your career or not really yeah um, in some ways yeah I think I think it, it probably did hold me back but I am more recently, certainly, I do think believe somehow that things just happen at the right time for you. You know, I mean, who knows? I, I, I certainly feel that the sort of latter part of my writing, my, my writing years have been stronger. So maybe one of the reasons that I, I feel that I've developed in performance is that I, the product that I'm that I'm delivering is of high standard. So maybe if I had that confidence, but not had the material, say ten years ago might not have had the same success but I think that the fact that I've, I feel like I've got strong a strong material and um, a really good um, a really good concept in my head of the voice that I want to express I think it's easier to deliver a performance when you when you're clear and I think I was quite unclear before you know I was doing a lot of different things and trying a lot of different things probably due to lack of confidence more than anything so I think yeah when it comes together it's easier to deliver <laughs> well it's a funny thing because you know when you're not confident uh, I guess one of the things that you can one of the ways in which you can deal with it is to prepare 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 practice a lot and then because of that you actually get more competent and then when you're more competent you be, do become more confident so you know it's a positive spiral yeah yeah absolutely and I think that um yeah, I think I think confidence is such an interesting thing in music, and I think that it's something that should actually be taught at music college. You know, I think we should have a, a unit in in confidence and in in, de in developing that as part of your practice. Because I see so many musicians that uh, you know, really talented musicians that suffer in from lack of confidence, and it does hold them back a lot. You know. And if you were to to talk to your younger self and and give her a little bit of advice to help her develop that confidence, uh, what would you be saying? I think one of the biggest things that I would say there to to my younger self is to just let go of perfectionism because I think perfectionism is a huge is something that really holds holds musicians back. And I say this a lot. It's about waiting until everything's perfect before you before you put it out, before you release a record, before you um, before you do a performance. And I was a very very strong uh, instrumentalist, and I was a, a strong writer, but I held back a lot, I did, perhaps from opportunities, because I didn't feel like that this recording was good enough, or I didn't feel like this was quite good enough, or I didn't feel like my voice was quite good enough. And I think in retrospect, I think I should have just got out there and 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 performed more and delivered my original material more because I think what what you see or what I've seen in other artists is that they develop on the journey not in a cupboard at home you know yeah, absolutely <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and funnily enough sometimes the people who are quite terrible don't even think about it twice you know <laughs> yeah this is this is really interesting I mean I, th I, I do know artists that haven't that don't play play well they don't play instrumentally very well They've got um, untrained voices. That's not to say they're not good artists because they believe that they've got something interesting to, stay, to say and they do it enough and with enough bravado and confidence that it's, it's uh, received very well. So I think it's it's taken a little bit of that. And I would, If I could go back, I would maybe try and adopt a little bit of that into my practice. Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know if you know, but uh, I wrote a whole book about this sort of thing because for me, I, I had a big uh, problem with performance anxiety. And, and I know now that, uh, and I, I wish I knew back then, that imposter syndrome is actually correlated to high intelligence. So uh, the more intelligence 
you are, the more you are prone to overthinking, overanalyzing. And so therefore you will analyze yourself, compare yourself to other people, find yourself lacking, and then not basically get paralyzed. You know, whereas, it, you know, if you don't think about these sort of things, then you're more likely to just go out there, do your thing, learn, get better. And, you know, then you get yourself out there a lot more. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big lover of Bren Brown. I don't know if you know Brenny. Oh, Brown. yes, of course. She's my hero. Yeah, yeah she's my <laughs> hero as well. And I, I love the arena concept that she talks about a lot about getting into the arena and how you can only really grow in, you know, in your dreams, really, once you set foot in there. But I think I spent too much time in the wings, you know, earlier, certainly, you know, as a young, a much younger sort of artist, um, not really... Uh, not really daring, not really daring to get out there. And I think that um, there was a turning point where I just thought, right, <laughs> yeah, this is going, you know, this isn't going to, this isn't going to get the gravitas that I want if I just stay, if I just stay in the wing. So Yeah. And I think what she says about um, the fear of criticism and that will hold you back, I, I really can relate to that because um, the, the thing that I really liked about her message is that she says something along the lines of, if you haven't stepped into the arena and you criticize me, I don't really care about your criticism because, you know, <laughs> it's easy to criticize from over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, but I think as a young woman, it can be really daunting. And, you know, we, we ask of ourselves way too much and uh, compare ourselves way too much with other people. And with maturity, we tend to do a li- that a little bit less. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So um, you were talking about your creative voice earlier, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. You know, I know that before the interview started, I asked you what you'd like to talk about. And one of the things you said is you wanted to explore this idea of finding the creative voice. So I'm curious about that. What um, what does that mean for you, finding the creative voice? I think for me, um, I think being, uh, you know, a, a multi-instrumentalist as a, as a younger as a younger performer and um but being involved just in a lot of different projects I think what I probably did was too much you know I probably spread myself a little bit thinly in uh, in in projects etc and um while I was able and I had the skills to do a lot I felt like that the sort of central creative voice was was lacking in some ways and I think it just took time for me to really really sort of go back to basics as to what I wanted to say and, and why I wanted to say it and what um, what kind of arrangements that I wanted to use and what instruments I wanted to use to do that. So I think for me, um, I, I was always, I mean, I'm a pianist and, and I'm a harpist. So I've always been interested in this kind of, um, in acoustic instruments. You know, I love acoustic instruments. I love um, I love playing on real pianos. I love playing on, on harps, obviously because of the wood and, um, it's it's such a satisfying experience, but I've also really been always been interested in technology, music technology. Um, uh, probably within the setting of a singer songwriter. So, for example, I was into artists like Bjork, Lamb, Radiohead, um, who are using electronic music to, you know, sort of merging it with the singer songwriter genre. Um, so, I think that was something that at one point I went off in a quite an electronic direction. And um, that wasn't me. That wasn't where I wanted to be. So what I've kind of been doing more recently is taking the instruments that I love and um, and using them and enhancing the, the arrangements that I make using technology. Um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying that. I'm really enjoying finally finding a sound that I think is really mine, you know, that I've really developed and created and then using my voice within that as well. OK, so are you talking about electroacoustic then uh, music? Yeah, kind of. So what I do is, for example, I sample. Um, yes. Yeah, so, for example, I I sample. Um, I'll take a piano and I'll I'll use extended techniques. So, for example, I'll take the front off and I'll pluck the strings, or I'll use different things to put in the strings to create different sounds. Um, when when I'm playing, um, so for example, you can put you can put metal objects onto the strings, and then when you play the piano, it's just it, it changes the tone. So I would sample that. And then use um, I use Ableton and use Ableton Push um, and and then I would use, I would enhance that sound using various plugins and then play that live alongside the instrument you know so it kind of creates this this um, multi layered effect. 
And um, do you have a process that you go through uh, systematically every time? Or is this process informed by the moment, the inspiration of the moment? Uh a little bit of both to be honest I tend to work backwards and I sort of imagine a sound that I want to create in my head and then try and work out a way of doing it you know um so I, I spend a lot of time on YouTube looking up techniques recording techniques and different ways of trying to create create certain effects or certain sounds um I um sometimes just experiment for example I'll um I'll create some sounds from the piano and then um, use some plugins. I use Ableton mainly, um, and you know use different filters or use um, different reverbs and delays just to um, just to alter the samples and see what interesting effects that I can come up with. Um, and then I I create for a track. I would generally at the moment I've been creating like a bank of sounds that I will use for that track. And then when I'm happy with the bank of sounds, then I'll work out how I'm going to interact that live into the performance or into the recording. Right. And have you always used Ableton or is this a, a new development? Uh, no, it's a new. I, I've I've used them all, I think. <laughs> I started with, started with Cubase and then I went on to Logic. And then, yeah, more recently I've been using Ableton. Yeah, That's interesting. I'm, I'm, I started... I, I, I think I started on Cubase, but I hated it and I went on to Logic as well. And and now I'm doubling with Ableton. But of course, it's a bit of a jump going from Logic to Ableton. It's very different. And um, what have you found um, is Logic good for and what have you found Ableton better at? I think Ableton's better at, I think, the, um, I think because you've got... Um, you're able to sort of see, record the clips and use samples. I think you can use samples more effectively, just the way that it's laid out in the two different views that you've got um, so that you can play around with samples. And I use the Ableton Push, um, so I connect that in as well. And I think for me, being an instrumentalist and, and you know piano player and always composing at a keyboard, I think taking the keyboard element away and having a push, which obviously um, is, a, is a grid, um, and you can trigger samples or you can also play samples um, without getting away from the traditional keyboard form. And I think that just allowed me to be more creative in some ways because I wasn't stuck to that. I mean, you probably can do that in Logic now, but I think at the time when the Ableton push came out and that was when I first started using that new format of um, of taking samples and, um, and, and working with samples in that way. So... Wow, it's yeah. Using Ableton can be a, a bit of a um, steep learning curve, though, at the beginning for people who've never used it before. Do you have any suggestions? You know, how did you learn it? To be honest, I just kept. I mean, um, I I'd ha I had a few lessons actually with a friend of mine who who uses Ableton um, a lot and um, delivers a, a lot of his work using Ableton. So I did have a few lessons, but I just learned on YouTube and I just. Um, I just played, you know. I didn't. I didn't follow any. And if I encountered a problem, I would find out how to solve it. Um, I didn't take any courses or anything like that. I mean, I had um, a, a a big history of working with digital audio workstations, so I'd used different doors in the past. Um, so I think the, the the a lot of the knowledge that you gain from using different programs it is transferable. Um, so yeah, I just learned on the on the fly. I think. <laughs> So basically, you are your own producer. And uh, my question around that is, did this emerge out of necessity or was it a passion of yours? Um, I think a bit of both, to be honest. I think um, I think it's possibly emerged out of perfectionism as well. <laughs> I spent a lot of time going into studios and just not feeling like I had enough time to really get the sound and the effects that I wanted, especially when you're on the clock, you know. Um, and I just felt that it would cost me thousands to, to keep paying to go into a studio and do it and try and develop that sound. So I started doing it on my own. Um, I am a member of the Noise Floor, which is a studio in Leith, um, which is kind of a communal studio where people can buy memberships. And um, I go there as often as I can, and I've got a little home studio. And I just started really experimenting with sound myself and creating a really good sort of idea of the of the the sounds and the arrangements and the technology that I wanted to use and 
and record my own vocals. And then um, I would then sometimes, sometimes what I have done, for example, with the um, I think I've just shot my horse song, I had some help in recording that. Um, little bits of help, just maybe a, um, a colleague of mine would come in and just help me, for example, really set up the mics really well on the harp, and then I would do it myself. And then I took the final version to be mixed because I don't really enjoy mixing. Right, no, I don't I enjoy, enjoy it. I enjoy tracking. <laughs> I enjoy getting the, the sound that I want, but then to really sort of <laughs> dot the I's and cross the T's, I just lose patience. And I can't, I, I can't be... Um, I... Um, objective you know because it's me and it's my it's my sound so I, and it takes the joy out of it listen to things over and over and over again for me like once I've got the creative part out of the way I'm quite happy to hand it over to um to uh, the producer and I tend to use um a friend of mine who's um Stephen Watkins who's a fantastic um producer and he's really great with mixing and um and that part I will pass on yeah, I can relate to that. I I studied uh, I studied a bit of production at university back in the day, and every once in a while I refresh. But it's just really not my thing, mixing and and also like it's you've got to have a very very fine ear. Like I remember listening to uh, tutors switching on and off the equalization or the compression going, see the difference? And I'm like, I can't hear anything. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. You do. It, it, it's an art, you know. I mean, you know, mixing is such a fine art, really, um, that I'm quite happy to hand that over. I really enjoy the creative side of tracking and experimental side of tracking and creating, you know, merging sounds and creating different effects. But when it comes to the the mixing, I'm quite happy to give that to someone else. <laughs> yeah. And have you had any difficulty in this area um, that came specifically out of the fact that you're a woman? And, and, and I would like to kind of explain what I mean by that, because when I first started doing this myself, um, I was the only woman I knew who was interested in this kind of area and all the people that knew what was what were men and I had a lot of difficulty uh, learning from them because uh, maybe I just was unlucky and met a lot of men who were not very good at teaching and just wanted to show off um, but I basically decided that I was going to do this by myself because I was sick of you know having to depend on somebody else or being kind of looked at as a bit of an idiot because you know I'm just <laughs> I'm just a girl and I'm just supposed to uh, sing or something so um, I don't know, is your experience been positive or has it been troubled? Um, I would say, to be honest with you, I, I can relate to what, you, what you're what you saying, but I think that happened to me more as an instrumentalist in, in my very sort of early career, like university and being in bands when I was first starting out. Uh, so I could totally relate to what you're saying. I think because the production came possibly a little bit later in, in my life, but also as times were maybe changing and attitudes were changing a little bit, which the, I mean, we've still got a long way to go, obviously, um, towards women in music and electronic music. I, I can honestly say that the, the interactions I've had have been very positive. I do feel that when I go to electronic music nights um, or nights where people are sharing um, pieces that they've used, using creative technology, that there is... Um, there's generally much more of a male bias that, the, you know, you can count the women present on one hand um, who are actually creating in that genre, um, which is a shame, you know. Um, but it's also kind of nice because you generally will end up, I, I, I'm i generally interested, I think because I'm quite interested in the use of women's voices, um, particularly, um, and how that's used in technology, that I'll generally end up chatting to someone, uh, another woman who's who's, who's creating and um, I've forged probably quite a lot of friendships that mm -hmm, way mm -hmm. from, from us being in the minority. Yeah, I wonder, you know, do you, why do you think this happens? Why do you think that women are underrepresented in this particular area of the music industry? Do you have any theories about it? Is it a matter of perhaps of expectation, you know? Is it that we don't have models, do you think? Possibly, possibly. I mean, you know, to try and think about women, you know, I'm trying to think, for, exa for example, of women's who, women who are using technology in a creative way to record and present the work, um, I can't think of that many. Um, you know, I mean, for example, one of my biggest influences was Bjork or somebody that I thought, wow, that's amazing what she's doing. Um, but there's, yeah, there's not 
that many. I think that I think no, I've noticed a few more coming up on the scene, um, but I certainly think it's um, yeah, I think just just underrepresented. So I think yeah, hopefully more role models might inspire young women to um, to 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 move more towards technology. As I certainly do think it is happening a little bit, but. Um, We've got a long way to go. Yes, yeah. A name that this brings to mind is Imogen Heap. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, with her. yeah, exactly. She's great. I mean, I think she's absolutely fantastic. Um, um, so yeah, people like her. Um, and yeah, it would just be nice to see a few more of them, really. Yeah. <laughs> so when you were talking about um, the troubles you had uh, as an instrumentalist in this area, what, what do you mean? What what was the, did you face discrimination or what was going on? Um, well, yeah, I mean, um, I started, you know, I started playing in bands when I was 17 and uh, being from the northeast of England, um, we've got a lot of uh, pubs and clubs there. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Worker Men's Club. <laughs> uh, so the Worker Men's Club, um, a big part of the sort of northeast heritage, they're um, clubs that would generally be, around the you know mining and, and um railway workers um and generally really the um audiences were made up a lot of, of a lot of men so i started playing up pl playing um with bands who were i was the only woman in the band and um i would play in these venues and, uh, and you know just a couple of things happened really i mean i remember being told by the band leader that i had to wear skirts <laughs> you know and as a 17, 18 year old, you know, young woman who was sort of, I was quite into indie music at the time. I liked Gwen Stefani and I liked wearing, you know, combat trousers and a top and I had my nose pierced. And um, um, that was kind of, I was kind of told that that wasn't the look that they wanted and they wanted me to wear a dress. And um, um, I could understand if they were sort of saying, oh, we, we want to go for this aesthetic with a band, we're all going to wear black or something like that. But to tell me to dress in a certain way just because I was a woman, I just, you know, I didn't like it. And I did, I, you know, I mean, I argued with them and um, I I didn't wear a dress. <laughs> but, I, well, I did when I wanted to. You know, it wasn't that I was against wearing dresses. I just didn't want to be told that I had to wear a dress. So um, I can remember that. I really remember that, um, you know, that sort of time. And when I was playing in these bars, so the, the workmen clubs, um, they, when I, when I, I'm not, I'm not even sure if they still have this now because, I mean, I'm talking sort of 15 years ago, but they had rooms that were men-only rooms. <laughs> and, um, you know, I can remember we'd always arrive early with the band and we'd go, you know, we'd go in to the, to the club and have a walk around and maybe just stop somewhere for drinking. I remember getting thrown out of a bar because I was, because we'd, we'd, we'd walked into the men-only bar by mistake, not realising, because sometimes it wasn't obvious. And I can remember a barmaid just, just sort of, kicking off and saying you need to you need to get out of this bar now because you I can't serve you you know so just the, I think just the venues at the time were just a little bit um back in dark ages with with that kind of thing you know yeah yeah my god I wonder if they're still there I hope I not know, for sure I know um it's it's a while since I've been in one so I'm not sure <laughs> jeez <laughs> I know I know about uh, maybe about eight years ago I was in and there was still one right um yeah so it's a little bit like the the all male golf clubs club kind of um, situation, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Still a long way to go. It's a long way to go. Yeah. And um, now on a different subject, you you were telling me that you've got a new video coming out. So do you want to tell us a little bit about? Yeah. So this is a video that I recorded um, to go alongside a single release, which was. Um, I think so. The name of the, of the song is "I Think I've Just Shot My Horse," and um, unfortunately, due to the lockdown, it's just all being delayed a little bit. Um, so I released the song um, a few months ago, but the video hadn't, yeah, gone, gone to, got been released. So, um, so I recorded this at Lee Theatre, and Lee Theatre is uh, one of my favourite venues. Um, I, I love it there. I love the acoustics there. I just love the whole feel of the place. And um, what was quite ironic about it, well. Well, it wasn't then, but it is now, is that I recorded this and I'm um, in the video, I'm actually kind of singing to an empty theatre. And um, I just thought that it was quite interesting releasing it now um, when <laughs> so many uh, musicians are performing live um, in, in empty theatres. You know, we've seen a lot of artists kind of doing these um, 
online broadcasts from empty spaces and it just feels really eerie to sort of uh, see that video performance now um when when obviously musicians can't perform and, and who knows when we're going to be able to perform again so yeah absolutely, absolutely. that's quite poignant poignant isn't it yeah yeah it wasn't until yeah when I um I kind of watched it again, I was like, oh my word, this is so so strange, yeah. And I guess I wanna I do wanna ask you um a bit more about that, but first I want to ask you about the title of that song. Where does that title come from? I just shot my horse. Well, I can't actually be honest with you. I don't, I don't feel like I can even really explain it. I mean, I think a lot of my lyrics they're so um I think if I explained it, it would spoil it. Okay. You know? <laughs> Um, I, I have this chat sometimes with my um, with my boyfriend because he's a poet, and um, it, we we've sort of decided not to explain things to each other anymore because it's just so interesting. I think how people interpret in, interpret work, and I just think that if I explained it, it might just it might just spoil it. I will say though, I love horses. Um, I have I love animals. Um, it's I have no plans or have had no experiences in the past of hurting any horses. I do feel like I have to say that. It's metaphorical. <laughs> it's not literal. Yeah. <laughs> Don't call the, the SBCA, please. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so going back to... Um, to the empty theater syndrome, well, the problem that a lot of us have been experiencing, how have you been coping with this all chaotic time? Well, yeah, it's been really hard, um, especially for me, I think, um, um, I, I was a, a single mother for a lot of years, um, certainly for the last five years, um, and having my daughter suddenly off school meant that creativity was really, really hard because um, I'd gone from being quite active and doing lots of gigs and having time to, to record and write to suddenly just being a full-time mother again, um, but in the house, not able to see anyone or get a babysitter around. <laughs> um yeah, so I think that that was, um, you know, it was just me and my daughter on on our own in the house for, for a long time. I just think um, creatively, creatively, it was really hard to um, to make anything because of the headspace. And I think obviously with, with everything else that was going on outside, I had lots of gigs cancelled. Um, in early March, I did a big th a gig at Leith Theatre, which was um, live soundtrack and um, a 1920s surrealist film. Um, and it was a, a, an event celebrating women in creative um, and electronic um, mediums. So it was it was looking at a um, film from the 1920s that was um, directed by a female uh, director and producer at the time. It was a French film. And um, it was myself and another electronic musician who, who live scored the soundtrack. So the theatre was full. It was brilliant. And we were hopefully planning to then cure cinemas with that project. And... Um, it all, it all just got cancelled, you know, um, and I think that the future is looking quite bleak regarding live performances. Um, so, yeah, I feel a lot of grief. I feel a lot of grief. I think there's a lot of collective grief um, around musicians that I think maybe people who are not in the industry, um, the creative industry might not be able to sort of tap into or understand in some ways, you know. I think there's one thing about losing work because we have lost, a lot of people have lost work. But what's happening with music specifically, for example, not being physically allowed to sing, singing being banned, you know, uh, because because of the production of aerosols. So, I mean, it just feels like some strange futuristic dystopian drama where, you know, a world where singing's banned and wind instruments are banned. I just never thought six months ago. So I think there's a loss of actual work of gigs, but the, the psychological thing of having something you love being physically banned because it's a, it's a health risk, you know. So I, I think that's just such an interesting and tragic situation. You know? It is. And I mean, it, even when you look at it from a from a different perspective, even in the general public, you go to a restaurant and you, there's no music now. I mean, that's quite weird. Um, it's kind of being transported into a parallel universe where we are not where music doesn't almost doesn't exist um only exists on a screen in your own room <laughs> and uh and in all you know when you're talking about psychology psychological well-being uh, well it's all about connection you know um emotional connection that gets that carried through uh, the voice and also just interacting with other band members 
So I guess it's about trying somehow to find that connection virtually somehow. I'm not sure. I mean, I've interviewed some people who have had some interesting ideas about this. I mean, have you tried to do live streams? How do you feel about that kind of thing? Well, to be honest with you, yeah, I, I was very reluctant at the start, but I think I was also in denial as to how long this was going to go on. Um, so I was very reluctant at the start. And when I have done online gigs, um, I think what um, what I would say is it's better than nothing. <laughs> It is. It's better than nothing. I did get, I did feel that the performance element, I did feel, still feel like I was performing in a way, um, even though I couldn't, you know, so, so much about my performance, certainly in the more recent years, is about really connecting with the audience, talking to them, um, you know, not just performing. And I found that side, I found that talking to people and actually making eye contact, because obviously you can't do that, that that, that was a, a barrier because, you know, I felt that a gig was made, you know, being able to see the audience and talk to them and jo make jokes and chat, you know, have a little bit of banter with the audience was a big part of the of the performance that we delivered. But I think it's better than nothing. I think that um, I think I, I will do some more live shows. I think um, what I'll probably maybe do is just do um, shorter shows as well. I think that um, everybody's a bit sick of looking at screens at the minute. So I think maybe short half hour bursts now and then, then is the way forward, you know. Um, but I, I think that maintaining an outlet is really important. And I think just to, even though it's not the same, performing in some capacity is, is good, good for the soul. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of the live show, the one thing that I found really weird, um, when I was doing them was the live comments coming through. I found them quite, I just didn't know how to deal with them it's like oh should i say something should i acknowledge this comment yeah or ignore it is that rude i just couldn't figure it out you know yeah i know i know totally yeah i think i just didn't look until the end because i just thought um you know because when i perform i've got quite a lot of things to think about with the harp and the pedals and the the samplers and stuff like that and i just sort of thought this is just too much for my head to think about to have to <laughs> yeah. to people as well <laughs> So um, one last thing I wanted to ask you about uh, your experience during the, the harder months of lockdown when you were saying you were with your daughter and uh, couldn't really get into creativity. So I get it that you're now out of the dark, um, of that dark period and that you're back creating. Um, and I, was, I wanted to ask you, how did you find your creativity back? You know, how did you cultivate it? Well, um, I made myself do an hour's writing every day when Audrey was in bed. That's my daughter, um, which did help just keeping something going. You know, I mean, some some nights I wasn't doing any, you know, I was just really sitting at the piano. But um, I think that now, you know, especially, um, I mean, childcare and childcare just obviously has just such a dramatic um, effect on what women can achieve, you know, um, and men. But I think... Um, Obviously, oh sorry. Obviously, historically, it's been um, it's been a, a women that have generally been primary carers, certainly historically. Um, so I think that just having more headspace allowed me to. And I think also there was something about going into that period of sort of darkness um, that made me, in a strange way, get louder. <laughs> it, it certainly made me be able to focus some of the ideas that I had, and um, I felt that it. In some ways, it strengthened my voice a little bit and it allowed me to um, maybe some some of the positives of lockdown, I guess, was not having as many distractions. I mean, obviously, it was a good thing and a bad thing, but I think that I was able to. Um, yeah, I think I think that sort of getting to a really dark place um, was a, a good place to sort of start building back to to create some new ideas and new sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you use, you almost use the darkness to, in a way to get inspired. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think um, the, one of the songs that I wrote, which is the um, make big sounds is about when you feel like you've got nothing left and you feel like you've got no voice left or you feel like you've totally lost your voice. You feel like you can't say anything that you, you've got nothing to say when you get to that point where you feel like, your creative voice is just dead about just sort of hearing a tiny sound and then that sound getting bigger and bigger and getting louder um, through time of darkness, which I think is might not sound, um, might not be easy to understand when I'm saying it in words, but hopefully the song, <laughs> when, it, when it's finished, will 
you know, I guess what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing from you is that you're putting it through the art, like you're putting that, yeah, that darkness, the, the way that you're feeling, the negative way that you may be feeling through the art. So you're expressing that feeling through your creative expression. Is that? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So we've come to the point of this interview where I'm going to ask you to play us a song. Would you like to tell us the title of the song? Yeah, this is called Make Big Sounds and um, it's a song that I was just talking about there about coming sort of out of the dark and um, finding your voice again after a period of darkness. Perfect. Okay, so should we just give it a go then?
Uh, I really like that sentence. Those two sentences make big sounds when you're feeling small and she got louder in the dark. Thank you so much for being on the show, Aurora. Well, that's not your real, real name, but uh, we will not uh, reveal what the real name is. It's going to be shrouded in mystery. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably it's probably quite easy to find out, to be fair. But yeah, let's keep the air of mystery. Yeah, just yeah. just Google it. <laughs> yeah, just Google it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for all your wisdom and um, for everything that you've shared with us. And uh, if people want to hear more about you, where should they go? Uh, well, I am everywhere on social media. I'm on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Aurora Engine. I think Instagram is Aurora Engine Music. Awesome. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Bye-bye. That was my guest, whom I'd like to thank once again for coming to the show. Every week I'll be chatting to fantastic indie performers to uncover what it really takes to be a female independent singer-songwriter in this day and age and how we can support one another to keep shining our light onto the world through our creative endeavors. So make sure you don't miss out by subscribing to Dare to be Seen and follow us on socials at tinyurl.com slash dare to be seen pod. That's all for this episode of Dare to be Seen. Join the conversation on facebook.com slash groups slash Dare to be Seen podcast and help create an empowering community of independent female singer-songwriters who support one another. For show notes, resources and information on today's episode, visit tinyurl.com slash dare to be seen pod. And remember to shine your own unique light onto the world. It needs it. Thank you.